Good morning, good day, g'day, hello. To some of us, it's good evening. Um, welcome to the, our next session here today for Aussie Live. Today, we're welcoming Dr. Harry Tuttle from the US, uh, a gentleman who has been using computers since I was born, which is an interesting um, time period, um, quite a while ago. Um, <laughs> I feel a little bit old. Um, what Harry focuses on in his education is, um, particularly now, is, is focusing on creativity and higher level thinking when using mobile devices. He's presented at many different conferences, including ITSI, the Tech Forum, and Global Education, and as well as our Aussie Live conference. He has an e-book that you can look into as well, which may help you with your classroom and e-learning, or mobile learning. Um, Harry is a, has been a presenter for the Aussie Live since it began, and today he has another session running straight into this one, so good luck with that, Harry. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Adult Learning Australia and Broadband for Seniors. Thank you very much for your sponsorship. The Australia E-Series, who are the team that bring you this um, conference, we have worked very hard to get this organised for you. So. Welcome and thank you for coming. And lastly, the Learning Revolution Project and Steve Hargaden, who without his support, we wouldn't be able to do this for you today. Um, and through Blackboard Collaborate, Steve allow gives us these rooms to use. So thank you very much, Steve. We really appreciate it. So as we're getting started today, let's have a look at where we are. So if you go to the left, you can grab a little icon and put it in your part of the world. So I'm in Queensland, so I'm a little smiley face, a little bit too far up there, uh, in the north of Australia. Um, if you're able to, people who are on mobile devices, you won't be able to do this, so you might like to type in the chat where you are, or where you're listening from. Um, those people watching the recording, uh, you won't be able to do this. Alrighty. Move on. Okay, so Harry, it's all over to you now. Thank you very much for presenting today, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing about, uh, your session. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for attending this session. It's one that's very dear to my heart. Um, I actually did my dissertation in the area of teaching of culture, um, and it's something that I have followed through for many years in terms of trying to find ways of doing that. So I'd like to start out with the American Council of Teachers of Foreign Language and has two different standards that they have for teaching of culture. One is that it relates cultural practices to perspectives. Uh, learners use the language to investigate, explain, and reflect on the relationship between practices and perspectives. And the next one is a very similar one. Um, between products and perspective studies. So we have a, a national basis for doing that. And we also have another organization that equally has a standard. Uh, the International Society for Technology and Education has a communication collaboration standard, which is develop cultural understanding and global awareness by engaging with learners of other cultures. And I think that's a wonderful statement uh, for all of us to consider doing. So those are the two bases on which I'm going to be talking. And I've sort of come up with a three-tier approach to culture. And the three levels, as you can see on the screen, and we're going to go through and actually go through examples of each of these, is learning about another culture, communicating with people in that culture, and collaborating with people in that culture. And there are three very different steps. And I think as we go through this presentation, you can decide what level you're really on for doing this. And one of the things that, as we think about this, we really want to think about how much of the student's learning involves interacting with another class, another school, another community, another state, another United, uh, other states, another country, several countries. And if we really expect our students to be global citizens, then I think we have to begin making things that they can become global. And so 
So what I'd like to start out with is the very first level. And we're going to talk about learning about the other country or culture. And what usually happens is that we teach the facts about the country, where it's located, its capital, what type of money they use, what the flag looks like, the famous places, what are some typical foods, transportation, sports and activities, art, music, dance. And as you can see from this list, they're pretty factual information. And you may have had your students, or you may have actually done presentations on talking about another country. And these happen to be ones that students have put together on different countries. Some of you may have, in fact, um, in elementary school, quite often they do a flat Stanley. And I know some teachers that are doing flat Stanley around the world type projects. And for those of you that aren't familiar with flat Stanley, he's this little creature called Stanley that's usually a drawing or a piece of cardboard that people take with them to different places around wherever they're going and then they tell about his or her his adventures in this case. So there are people that are doing that. As you probably all know, there are um, many web resources you can take your students to to learn about, for example, in this case, Italy. I'm sure you're aware that there are many apps that, for example, this is Egypt Travel Guide, and you can download this app and learn all about things about the country. There's um, many things, such as Google Night Walk. You can go to a country and walk to the country. You can, along the same line, use Google Maps. Um, and there's various things on Google Maps where you can explore a country in detail. Another thing that might happen is you might have someone coming to your room who's visited that country. And they can talk about it. So those are generally some of the ways we begin to learn the facts about a country. However, there is a certain disadvantage to all of that previous information. And that is, what we're only dealing with is the easiest to see things. The visible culture is really what it's usually called. And the other problem becomes that if we want our students to develop positive feelings about people from other countries, learning facts does not do that. That's just like learning the facts like you would for a social studies test. It doesn't really help our students to feel positive about other people. And so we're going to try to begin talking about other ways in which we can make our students move from this factual knowledge um, into a more vigorous knowledge. The other thing I want to comment on is that usually when we talk about the culture of another country, we're talking as an outsider to that culture. Um, I'm a Spanish teacher and an English teacher. And I visited 14 different countries, spent lots of times in countries. I spent two whole summers in Ecuador. And yet, I don't claim to know the Ecuadorian culture. Um, so I really think we're looking at an outsider's view of the culture, even when we present some information about it. The other thing that quite often happens is that we as a teacher are presenting the culture to the students. It's really a lecture, um, as opposed to students actually being able to investigate culture. And we're going to be talking about some ways so they can begin moving much more towards investigating the culture and becoming active in learning about that culture. One of the things that quite often happens is that many cultural reports are missing people. Um, I actually have had the opportunity to see two presentations recently on Paris. And on those two presentations, I saw all the famous monuments. I never once saw a person. And so sometimes we get trapped into teaching the monuments, the famous buildings, which really do not help us to know the living people. And that's really what culture is about for us, is learning how we can interact with people. 
So I think it's critical to do that. The other problem that sometimes happens is that they do include people, but they include stereotypes. And that's something we certainly want to avoid in our cultural presentations about to students. So these are some of the disadvantages of doing factual reports. Um, if anyone has any comments, if you want to comment in the comment bar about this section. wonderful talking about, yeah, how we do get lost in the monuments. Um, a personal experience is that um, I spent a whole summer traveling in Peru, and um, I then went to another teacher's presentation on Peru, and she talked particularly about Machu Picchu, and her whole presentation was on Machu Picchu. And so I politely asked her, do any people live at Machu Picchu? And she goes, well, no, not now. And I go, so why are we learning about this? Why aren't we learning about the people that are living in the country? And I think it's too easy to get caught up in, in that type of things. Okay. So any other comments from anybody? Yes, thank you, Craig. The people, people is really what makes it all about. Okay, so I'm if anybody has any more comments, I'll look at them. I'm just going to begin the second section. And this is communicating with a person or people from another country. And so this basically raises the level of what we're going to do. And I want to share with you, um, are there any resources you find recommend, uh, you know, about people? Um, my next screen, I think, might help. So this happens to be from the Global School Net. And this is different types of collaboration that the Global School Net offers. And I'd like you to look at the different categories. The first category is information collection. We find out some facts about the people. We may create something together. We may each do our own research and pool it. But that still becomes really, we're just dealing with facts, numbers. We don't get to know the other people very much. We can begin to do some interpersonal exchanges, key pals, um, question and answering, expert monitoring, um, intercultural exchanges, travel buddies, uh, global classroom, um, that. And then we can also then move up to another level of actually problem solving, um, information searching, peer problem solving. Uh, we've actually done numerous things with classes in other countries about um, how can we reduce school pollution. And so that's an exciting thing to do. But the point is, how do we begin to contact people and work with them? And the next page just happens to have a few suggestions. Um, these are some activities from the Global Virtual uh, Classroom of some activities that they've done. Yep, Global Nomads is another great one. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, there's, there's lots of resources. And I think it's important for us to pick some of these and begin getting our students involved with them. So this one happens to have some projects about great men and women of the world, you know, who's important in your society, uh, beginning contrasting my land, your land. But I think we, the important thing I think is the beginning moving away from as much as we can factual reports to each other to more things about how we can relate to each other. And my next slide sort of helps, I think, to stress, stress this. And I think the important thing is how many different times are we interacting with the people from the other culture and how in depth do we go? Do we go beyond just super, getting superficial information to very to find a great deal about the people themselves? And the little star up on the corner, I think, is where we want to be. We want to interact with another class many times and find out a great deal about that class or that particular individual. And that's when we really have truly cultural relationships at that stage. And so I want to begin talking about some of the ways we can do it that are basic. We can obviously do things in text format. We can email, Twitter, Facebook, all those 
media type ways of doing things. And I want to give you one example. Um, you might have a poll that you send or questionnaire that you send out to students in another country. Uh, we've done this with um, elementary classes across the world. What time do you get up? What do you eat for breakfast? What time do you start school? How many classes do you have? Do you take lunch or buy lunch in school? And so we send the questionnaire out to the other students and we, we find out what common answers there are and we share that information. And so you begin to sort of get some ideas. Okay. So that's one great way we can begin doing things. And uh, okay, and then Ben has mentioned somebody doing something, so it's good to look at how other people are doing it. But these questionnaires, what's important to me about the questions that we ask is that these are student questions that they want to know about people in another country. And so we can begin to find out that information. And it's a, it's a rather simple way of doing it that we begin to having some discussions about things um, to do that with. Uh, many of you may have, in fact, tried mystery destinations. And a mystery destination is where one school partners up with another school, only, only the teachers know where those schools are located. And one school who's the host school sends a clue to the other school and they try to guess where it is and then they guess and then the hosting school gives another clue and they keep on going back and forth with um, giving more and more clues until they can figure out what the country is. So it's a really great project and it's been around now for oh, 15, 20 years. So it's a, a really fun thing to do. There's another thing that's been happening called Mystery Box. And um, basically, this has resulted because this is actually happening in the real world, that people are getting boxes of perfume. They're sending boxes of perfumes from the United States to France, and French people are sending perfumes to here. And you, you never quite know what's going to be in that box. And we can do the same thing with our students. Um, and I think the interesting thing about the mystery boxes is that we could just do it with pictures of things. They don't need to have the actual objects. Um, a quick comment back about the mystery destinations is many times mystery destinations originally started out as a text-based program where you would email back and forth responses. Um, the trouble is once you begin having a Skype conference about it, they can begin hearing things and seeing things that tell them more about where they are. So you can do it the way you want to, but it's an interesting thing to do. I would encourage all the rest of this as sort of in text-based. I would encourage that the best way we can do something is a video chat. And the video chat is powerful beyond all comprehension because, uh, and I want to tell you first about how to contact people. Um, I have found out that if I ask, email, text, or Facebook friends, relatives, students, and colleagues, I can find somebody in any country I need to. Um, and I do this every time in my, in my Spanish class, and someone knows someone knows someone that's in you know, another a Spanish speaking country and we can and have that person help us to connect. You can also use Skype education and there's other online programs that can help you to connect with people. And I'd like to share with you some ways in which you can do things. And they're sort of on a degree of from the simplest up to a little more complex and meaningful. Um, I was very fortunate that my school was one of the first schools to actually video conference across the ocean. Now, we did a conference with French students and we actually sang a song. We sang a song in French and then we sang a song in English and we did a little bit of talking about our schools. Um, so it was wonderful actually participating. And um, I'm going to talk about some of the advantages in just a second after I go through some of these, but I want to just sort of go through the different ones. Um, you can obviously do a My School, Your School project where people tell things about their school and then they ask the other class, does this happen in your school, doesn't it? So that's a great way to do it. Another variation of the same thing is um, where people choose a topic like houses. And what they do is they then tell, show 10 different houses that people live in in their area. to so short of showing that there is variety in each country. And we sort of share talk about the homes and what they're like and that. So that's another good project. The other thing you can obviously do is interview somebody as a whole class. And your class can prepare questions. And again, questions the students really want to ask, not questions you want to ask. 
but they have the students come up with questions and they interview this one person um, to find out information. And I have found that they work much, these interviews work extremely well when in fact you ask about a particular topic, like this happens to be celebrations. And so the whole quest, all the questions were about celebrations in the country. And so that having a one theme for an interview works really well if you're doing a generic one. Um, I have heard of classes that have each watched a um, movie, or in this case, a YouTube, and then they both have discussed it. What's your views on this? And so that's a great technique to do, that you both watch something and then you both have a discussion about it. And so I want to talk about the advantages of this. The advantages of a video conference is you see a real person from the culture in a real location. So I think it's really critical to know that we're actually seeing somebody. And when I show my students, this happens to be from a, uh, a picture of a similar thing that we did. And my students see this and they go, oh, where is he? And they go, he's, you know, this is a, a Mexican musician, they go, no, it can't be. So actually seeing another person dispels all the mist. And I have to tell you what happens and that amazes me all the time is the comments I hear, the students sort of say under their breath. And for example, the first time we did a video conference with people from Mexico, I heard a student say to me, but he's not wearing a sombrero, what's wrong? But it's that stereotype that they have. And, and video conferences allow us to get rid of those stereotypes to see real people doing real things. And it's a whole different environment. It also means that we can actually ask, and we've done this during numerous video conferences, we ask the person to take the, um, the Skype or whatever device they're using and to actually turn it. In one time, we actually had someone, uh, we were talking to a person and they happened to be in our house, and then they went to the window and showed us what was outside their window. So we could actually see the whole environment of it. And so it's a wonderful way to do it. And I would encourage people to video chat, Skype, whatever you want to call it, with people from another culture. Um, there is a couple of disadvantages. Um, one, the biggest disadvantage is the time difference. Uh, when we did the one from France, uh, we, were, we had to be at 6 o'clock in the morning, I think it was, for us to conference with them. But Quite often you can find people in a similar time zone that are a couple hours that make it easier that you can do this with. There sometimes is a language difference and you have to decide whether you want to speak with people in that country that know English or people that um, can help you to translate for that. But video content is really the way I think to begin changing the most impression stereotypes that our students have about other people and to see them as people. Um, and, and going back to this, Question, uh, thing about when my students actually sang the song with them in French, they said, that girl can't be French, she looks just like us. And I think those are the type of comments we want to be to hear our students say, so we know that they're actually changing that. So any questions or comments about interacting with other people for communication in mutual projects like that? Thank you, Carol. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and it, it, time zones really can be, and that's why I usually try to, like I said, choose things that are close to our time zone or maybe one or two hours off so we can pull it off. Um, I've actually had classes coming during the lunch hour or after school um, that are willing to video, do a video conference like that. Um, and the other thing that's sometimes possible is to find a person from that country who's in the United States but can still talk about their country and things in their country. And that always makes it a little bit easier um, to Skype with someone under those conditions. Okay, so I want to sort of begin talking about the next one. Yes, so time zones are really critical in terms of pulling this off. I want to talk about the next one, which moves beyond simply communicating with somebody to actually collaborating with that class to do something outside of the class. And that's a very different mentality. In the other ones, we've done, we do projects. We talk about things. We may collaborate on discussion. 
but it's, it's class to class, and it's the only benefit from it. So I'd like to give you some examples of this, and that is I've actually seen a thing where two schools have contributed, um, raised enough money so they could sponsor somebody in Kiva, and they chose someone that was trying to get education. And so these two classes then followed this person as they, you know, paid the loan and found out what had happened in terms of her being able to educate her children. But notice it's two classes working together for a third, another purpose. This goes beyond the local class. Um, I know some students and teachers take trips to other countries, and particularly happens in modern languages a great deal. And some of the, one of the big movements now is while you're there, actually help to do something, help to build humanity, help to uh, build a school, help with something where you can actually have a class in something worthwhile instead of just seeing the sites. You know, they will go back knowing much more about the people of the country because they've worked with them and they're doing things with them. So it's a, it's a wonderful way to interact with other people. Um, United Planet has lots of suggestions on doing things overseas, um, working with children in education, global health, um, environmental sustainability. There's other ways your students can get involved with these people. And sometimes what's really nice about it is um, we've actually had um, in our own community, uh, in my area of Syracuse, there's a large Hispanic community. And I know some teachers have had their students work with um, various organizations that have a lot of Hispanics in them to help them uh, learn how to cook how, American meals, learn how to do things. So I think we can begin to do that to interact with the other people in a helping relationship and it becomes a very different mentality. One of the things we can do is exchange art. And I want this project happens to be a, a city to city one, but I've heard of numerous schools now where the class has worked with another class, they've decided on an art project, and then they've exchanged the art project, and that art project goes in, you know, the school library, or more often, it goes in the town hall or the city hall, and, or the local art museum, and there's a special thing about it. So other people can learn about the countries. And so you're helping other people have a better view of each other. So that's a great way to do it. Okay, uh, this one was a tremendous project that I thought was, was interesting. A school was working with a school in Ecuador, and the Ecuador school was actually working on recycling and taking the recycling objects and making art out of them. And then they would distribute that art to various places in the community. And so the American school, the United States school that was working with this Ecuadorian school found out about it, thought it was a great project, they began doing it. And so what happened is the schools learned from each other, worked from each other, and then they each made projects and gave them to people in the community that they took these to nursing homes and, and helped, you know, to share the joy with people. So it's really a great thing to do when two classes come together and do something that's going to help something else outside of the classroom. So it's a, to me it's a very powerful tool. Uh, any other comments anybody has about those? Okay. Uh, I have a I have a quick question for you, Harry. Um, yeah. I agree there with Kath, Kathy's comment there. Um, I guess my, my questions around um, is, uh, the way that teachers can connect and how they can connect that to their curriculum. I know in, um, in America there's a possibly a little bit more um, freedom in how you can connect what you're doing with your curriculum. In Australia there isn't as many possibilities. You have to be very creative about how you connect with your curriculum. But I guess what my question is, is if teachers are looking for ways of connecting, are there any global groups that, for example, if they want to connect, use, connect to different cultures using art, um, do you have any resources other, uh, I know you've mentioned um, the global, uh, the one, the, I can't remember, what the global network. Um, are there any others like that around? So is there, have you got any other 
groups that you can connect with for that? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't. But what I would suggest is simply searching for something you're interested in having your students do, be it a science project, a math. We did collaborative math um, across the world. Mm -hmm. And to find it, I simply typed in math problems global. And we found a way to be able to do this. So there's so many ways that we can, I think what we have to say is what is it we really want our students to learn, and then how can we connect that to help working with people in other countries on that same type of a thing. And I have found that every time, um, I was the director of technology for numerous years, and one of the things that happened is anytime a teacher came up with a project, we could find somebody in another country to find somebody that, to think about it. Um, I just want to give you one quick example that was that one of our English teachers was having his students write an essay on freedom. And so I typed in essay global and I found a country, a, somebody in what was then Russia and said, hey, your school's working on a project on that. Can we exchange essays? And so we peer reviewed each other's essays on freedom and freedom in the United States and freedom in Russia meant two very different things. It was a wonderful thing to do. So I would encourage people to think of what do you want your students to learn and then searching for that on Google and trying to find other people. It's a great way to do it. Okay. So basically I'm just doing a quick promo and then uh, I'll ask any more questions. So I think really if we do this then we really will be building a better world. Our students will be not just no information. Um, oh thanks Kathy, appreciate that. She's doing a list of projects here. Okay. And so as we go through, we want to move our students up from learning about the culture to just communicating with them to actually collaborating with to do something to make it the world a better place. Okay. And um, just a quick plug that I do have a, a remote for modern language teachers. I have a book on 90 mobile learning modern language activities that has many cultural activities um, to do that. There's some information about myself in case anybody's interested. Other questions, please, or comments? Yeah, I think it's important we do share cultures and stories, um, storytelling, all those things are wonderful tools. Um, my only caution about whatever we do is to make sure that the other group can understand the culture. Um, and um, to give you an example, we have. Um, many Native American indigenous groups in our area and some of the storytellers are wonderful storytellers but I know I'm not getting the full culture because I don't understand the tradition behind some of these things so I think what we always have to do is make sure students can understand that culture that's happening within the story. Sometimes it's, it's so ingrained in the story that we don't necessarily as an outsider know what that is. So if people have other comments or questions, I'm happy to answer them. So if you've got a comment, type that into the chat for Harry, or if you'd like to um, ask the question yourself, just put your hand up and we'll, we'll um, get you talking there. Uh, is that a hand up? No, I can't see one there. Uh, thanks, Carol. The digital storytelling movement is brilliant. I know that as a primary school teacher, sharing stories about cultures is often uh, the easiest way to connect with children. Uh, one of my favourite books from recent times is by an Australian author artist called um, Jeannie Baker and it's called Mirror Mirror and what the book is is it shows the life of two children, one in Morocco and one in suburban Australia, Sydney, who knows, I'm not sure, I can't remember. And it shows how, how, what they do in their lives and how it's different and it's a brilliant book. Uh, from memory, I don't even, I'm not even sure there are any words in it or, or if there are words, there are not many. Um, I think that, that even just storytelling is a, is a brilliant way of sharing um, culture. Yeah, I agree with you. I would like to point out one thing though, and my dissertation was actually on something so simple. And my dissertation simply said that when students see similarities, 
they feel positive about another culture. When they see differences, they don't feel positive about another culture. So I always set out to a point of similarities, commonness, our oneness. And once I have them at that point, then I talk about diversity and differences because I don't want my students to begin thinking that people, other people are different than them right away because that doesn't help them to feel that there's a connection with that other person. So it's, it's something I think very difficult for us to connect to it as, as humans first and then what's our variation in our humanity. Um, and to me that, that's an important thing because I quite often see people showing, in, in particularly in the Hispanic speaking world, showing pictures of a very unique tribe and the kids look at them and go, ugh, I wouldn't want anything to do with those people. So I, I really want us to, our students to feel positive about that other culture. So thank you very much. For the Thanks, Harry. Yes, I wanted to pick up on the storytelling as well. Thanks, Ness, for putting up that information about Mirror Mirror. Uh, my background is in digital storytelling, and it's still used quite extensively in communities in Australia to share family history and community history to show the culture that has emerged be within those smaller communities in regional areas. And I think that it, um, it had its day back in the 90s, um, but now um, seems to have been faded a little bit. We've, we've used other ways of creating the storytelling and to share it widely. Uh, thank you, Harry, for your tips and for your links. And uh, I'll get you to put your uh, Gmail account into the text chat for us so that we can use that. Thank you. Okay. Was there anyone else in the audience that had any questions for Harry? Uh, I'd just like to go back to this slide, Harry, of yours. Um, and being a moderator, I can I can be sneaky and do that. Um, I really like this idea. Uh, a lot of our sessions over this weekend are about collaboration and glo global collaboration. And I think it's important for teachers and, and educators to see something like this slide, to know that there, there are different ways you can start to educate children in your class about different cultures around the world. And, and looking at it in this way for me shows that it is actually a relatively simple process. You know, we have to start to learn about it before we can actually start communicating um, with people from a different culture because I know from experience living in two different foreign countries in my lifetime so far that there are certain aspects of culture that you need to understand before you can um, participate in, in that society and even to know whether or not what you're doing is, um, uh, what's the right word, um, going to offend anyone or, or whether or not it's, it's acceptable. Uh, so learning about the culture is definitely the first and, I, I, and then communicating with people from that culture because you do learn so much from communicating with others. And then the whole idea of collaboration is where you can bring that all together. So I really, this is probably the one, the slide from, from your presentation, Harry, that I uh, have taken with me and, and it's in my little memory bank of, of, um, <laughs> of, of tools now. So thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed well, I appreciate everybody for attending, and like I said, if you have any comments otherwise, please email me, and I'm happy to interact with you later on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate everybody's comments and their suggestions about things to do. Yeah, great. So for those of you who are still in the room, I think if there's no more questions, we might finish the recording there and we can then move Harry out to his next room, which starts in a, about 20 minutes. If no other questions, I'll just give you a minute.
that shows out. Um, Okay, looks like no questions. I'll stop recording. So thank you very much, Harry. Anyone that wants to, um, no one that, anyone that wants to contact Harry, his details are there. So thank you very much, Harry. You're welcome. Thank you.